From the teenager who crashed her car and killed two people just to end her relationship to the teen who smiled in court after brutally ending the life of a helpless old woman, this shocking and thought-provoking video delves into the unsettling world of dangerous teens reacting to life sentences. Brace yourself as we examine the details of these crimes, the trials, and the accused's reaction to their life sentence while at the same time confronting the unsettling reality of young individuals capable of such violence. Jeremy Goodale First, we delve into the chilling details of the crime committed by Jeremy Goodale and Willard Miller, two dangerous teens whose actions shocked the community of Fairfield, Iowa. The murder of their high school Spanish teacher, Nohima Graber, sent shockwaves through the town and left everyone questioning how such a heinous act could occur. It all began with a deep-seated resentment that Goodale harbored towards Graber. Motivated by a bad grade she had given to Miller, Goodale and his friend hatched a plan to seek revenge. Armed with a bat, they stalked Graber as she took her daily walk in a local park, waiting for the perfect moment to strike. When the opportunity presented itself, they unleashed a brutal and ruthless attack on Graber, beating her to death. The violence of the assault was shocking, leaving the community in disbelief that two young individuals could be capable of such brutality. The investigation into the crime was swift and thorough. Law enforcement officials worked tirelessly to gather evidence and build a case against Goodale and Miller. The court acknowledged that Goodale knowingly participated in the murder and played a crucial role in its execution. Prosecutors presented a compelling case, highlighting the overwhelming evidence against Goodale and Miller. The court acknowledged the heinous nature of the offense and the need for a prison sentence to deter others from committing similar acts of violence. Throughout the trial, Goodale showed moments of remorse and accepted responsibility for his actions. He tearfully apologized to Graber's family, the community, and his own family, expressing deep regret for the irreparable loss he had caused. Judge Sean Showers carefully considered various factors in determining the appropriate sentence. He acknowledged Goodale's age, immaturity, and failure to appreciate the risks and consequences of his actions as mitigating factors. The court also took into account Goodale's lack of prior criminal history and the potential for rehabilitation. I'm required to consider and sentencing a juvenile for first-degree murder, the defendants shall be sentenced to life with the possibility of parole after 25 years. Ultimately, the judge sentenced Goodale to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 25 years. This decision was based on the unique circumstances of the case and the court's belief in Goodale's capacity for rehabilitation. Although the sentencing marked a turning point in Goodale's life, he managed to keep his emotions in check as he faced the harsh reality of spending a significant portion of his life behind bars. Mackenzie Sherilla Our story begins in a small courtroom in Ohio, where Mackenzie Sherilla, a 19-year-old girl, awaits her fate. Today is the day of her sentencing hearing, a day that will determine the course of her life. Sharilla was just 17 years old when she crashed her Camry into the brick wall of a commercial building outside Cleveland on July 31, 2022. By the time police arrived at the scene of the accident, Sharilla was already unconscious and the other occupants, Dominic Russo, who was Sharilla's boyfriend and his friend Dominic Flanagan, had died on the spot. The three had smoked marijuana before Sharilla took to the wheels, but this unfortunately wasn't a fatal case of driving under the influence. Influence. Mackenzie Sharilla had plans of murdering her boyfriend. According to prosecutors, Sharilla was in a toxic relationship with the then 20-year-old Dominic Russo and had deliberately crashed her car to end their relationship. On several occasions, the couple got into fights and one time she was overhead threatening to crash her car with Russo in it. At another point, she had threatened to key his car following an argument. Unfortunately, her threats would become a reality, and unfortunately for 19-year-old Flanagan, he was a victim of being in the wrong place at the wrong time. At the trial, a surveillance video was played showing how Sharilla had driven reasonably before picking up speed. She drove at 160 kilometers per hour before crashing the car. Prosecutors also presented a TikTok video where she wrote, I'm not even cool. I'm just one of those girls that can do a lot of drugs and not die, bragging about her drug tolerance. Before handing down the verdict at a bench trial, the judge had a few words for Sharilla. The video clearly shows the purpose and intent of the defendant. She chose a course of death and destruction that day. Exhibit 802 crystallizes the deadly decision-making of the defendant. She morphs from a responsible driver to literal hell on wheels. Mackenzie Sharilla, now 19, was sentenced to two concurrent sentences of 15 years to life for the death of Dominic Russo and Davion Flanagan. So she's sentenced on count to the murder of Davion Flanagan, 15 years to life. She's sentenced on count one, the murder of Dominic Russo, 15 years to life. 
to be served concurrent to each other with credit for time spent. Sharilla could be seen with a distressed look on her face, perhaps grappling with the consequences of her actions. Aiden Fucci. Next, we delve into a case that has sent shockwaves through the nation. We explore the horrifying details of the murder of 13-year-old cheerleader Tristan Bailey, who was murdered by her 14-year-old classmate Aiden Fucci. On that fateful day, May 9, 2021, Tristan Bailey's life was tragically cut short in a brutal and senseless act of violence. Aiden Fucci, who was just 14 years old at the time, lured Tristan into a secluded area near his home under false pretenses. What followed was a chilling and premeditated attack that can only be described as a nightmare come to life. The details of this crime are truly horrifying. Fucci stabbed Tristan a shocking 114 times, leaving her with 49 defensive wounds, 35 wounds to the head and neck, 29 wounds to the back and shoulder, and 6 fatal wounds. The sheer brutality of this act is difficult to comprehend. It is clear from the evidence that Tristan fought for her life, as the defensive wounds indicate that she was conscious and aware of the danger she was in. But what makes this crime even more chilling is the complete lack of motive. Fucci's actions were not driven by greed, revenge, or any other recognizable motive. Instead, he confessed to his girlfriend and a friend that he simply wanted to know what it felt like to kill someone. He described in disturbing detail how he would take his victim into a wooded area stab them, and then run away to continue killing. This level of premeditation and the absence of any moral or legal justification is deeply unsettling. As the investigation unfolded, more disturbing details about Fucci's behavior leading up to the crime came to light. He had a nickname for the murder weapon, a knife that he called poker. This choice of weapon added to the up-close and personal nature of the murder, making it all the more horrifying. It is rare to see such a brutal and intimate form of violence, making this case truly unique and shocking. During the trial, evidence revealed that Fucci attempted to cover up the crime by disposing of the murder weapon in a lake and hiding his shoes, shirt, and jeans. He even took a shower to remove any traces of evidence. It is clear that he was aware of the consequences of his actions and tried to evade justice, but his attempts to conceal the truth were in vain. In the back of the police car, Fucci filmed Snapchat videos trying to create a false narrative about pushing Tristan and her hitting her head. However, the video evidence clearly refuted his story, exposing the extent of his deception. It became evident that this was not an impulsive act of immaturity, but a cold and calculated crime committed with a complete disregard for human life. It was not done in, an, in a fit of uncontrollable anger. There was no reason. There was no purpose. It was done for no other reason than to satisfy this defendant's internal desire to feel what it was like to kill someone. The court, after reviewing the evidence and considering the nature and circumstances of the offense, came to the conclusion that Fucci's participation in this crime was not the result of immaturity or impetuosity. He understood the risks and consequences of his actions, as evidenced by his prior statements to his girlfriend. After considering all the evidence and the nature and circumstances of the offense, the court reached a verdict. Mr. Fucci, having entered a plea of guilty to the crime of first-degree murder, I adjudicate you guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. I sentence you to life in prison. Because of your age, you are eligible for a review of the sentence in 25 years. Aiden Fucci was found guilty of the premeditated first-degree murder of Tristan Bailey. The judge, Arlie Smith, handed down a life sentence, recognizing the severity of the crime and the need for justice. Nicholas Cruz On that fateful day on February 14, 2018, Nicholas Cruz, a 19-year-old troubled teenager, entered Marjorie Stoneman Douglas High School and committed one of the deadliest school shootings in American history. Seventeen innocent lives were tragically cut short, leaving a community shattered and grieving. A former student Student at the school, Cruz fled the shooting scene by foot and blended in with other students before he was arrested later in Coral Springs, an hour and 20 minutes after the shooting. Throughout the trial, Cruz's lawyers argued that he was mentally ill due to fetal alcohol syndrome, attempting to provide a possible explanation for his actions. However, this did little to alleviate the pain and anger felt by the families of the victims. They firmly believe that Cruz's mental state does not excuse the devastation he caused. On October 20, 2021, Cruz pleaded guilty to all the charges against him and even apologized for his crime. I am very sorry for what I did and I have to live with it every day and that if I were to get a second chance I will do everything in my power to try to help others. However, this didn't stop the families of the victims and survivors from expressing their hatred for the school shooter. My prayer for my birthday present is to get word that you are dead. To the killer of Alyssa Miriam Alphadeth. 
My hope is for you is that you are miserable for the rest of your pathetic life. Prosecutors argued for the death penalty, but the jury was deadlocked on whether or not the death sentence be imposed on Cruz, even though he was found eligible for the death penalty. The long-awaited sentencing verdict in the case of Nicholas Cruz, the gunman responsible for the Parkland school shooting, has finally been delivered. On November 2, 2022, Broward Circuit, Judge Elizabeth Scherer imposed a life sentence without parole, leaving many of the victims' families disappointed and angered by the outcome. Cruz was to serve a life sentence for each of the 17 counts of murder and a minimum of 20 years for 14 of the 17 counts of attempted murder. This ruling ensures that he will spend the rest of his life behind bars, unable to walk free. The judge, in addition to the life sentence, made a significant ruling to prevent Cruz from financially benefiting from his crimes. She garnished his commissary funds, ensuring that he would not profit in any way from the pain and suffering he caused. During the sentencing, Cruz appeared emotionless as the judge read the verdicts. Gavin Smith. Acts of pure evil. Those were the words from a judge today before he sentenced a teenager to the maximum time in prison that he was allowed for murdering four family members. Meet Gavin Smith, a name that will forever be associated with unspeakable horror. It was a crime scene straight out of a nightmare. In a quiet suburban neighborhood, the lives of four innocent individuals were brutally taken. Gavin Smith, then just 16 years old, embarked on a path of unimaginable violence, forever altering the lives of those around him. Gavin's victims were none other than his own family. His mother, stepfather, and two younger brothers, Risa Mae Saunders, Daniel Dale Long, Gage Ripley and Jameson Long fell victim to his cold-blooded rampage. The details of this horrific crime are enough to send shivers down your spine. The trial that followed painted a grim picture of the events that unfolded on that fateful night in December 2020. Gavin, armed with a gun, crept into the bedrooms of his sleeping mother and stepfather. Without a hint of mercy, he shot them both in the head, ending their lives in an instant. But the horror didn't end there. Gavin turned his attention to his two younger brothers, who were unaware of the impending danger lurking in their own home. Home. One of them, a mere toddler, was hiding under his crib, seeking solace in the innocence of childhood. Tragically, it was a hiding place that offered no protection from Gavin's wrath. The courtroom was filled with gasps as the details of these senseless killings were revealed. The judge, the jury, and the entire community struggled to comprehend the depths of darkness that resided within this young teenager. You executed your mother and stepfather by shooting them in the head while they were asleep. Then you executed your two brothers by shooting them in the head, the youngest which was hiding under his crib. Your actions can only be described as an act of pure evil. The judge's response was swift and unyielding. Gavin, now 18 years old but only 16 at the time of the murders, received the harshest punishment possible, life in prison. The judge made it clear that he believed Gavin felt justified in committing these heinous acts, a belief that sent shockwaves through the courtroom. Due to his age at the time of the crimes, Gavin will automatically be eligible for parole in 15 years. Nevertheless, the judge ordered that the maximum sentence for each crime be served consecutively ensuring that Gavin would serve one sentence after another. As he was led out of the courtroom, Gavin displayed no feeling of remorse or fear at the gravity of his sentence, Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero. In April 2021, the city of Las Vegas was rocked by a heinous crime that would send shockwaves through the community. It all began when 45-year-old Daniel Halseth, a loving father, was brutally murdered in his own home. The details of the crime were nothing short of horrifying. Daniel's burnt body, bearing the marks of 70 stab wounds, was discovered in the garage of his Las Vegas residence. The scene was one of unimaginable violence and cruelty. As the investigation unfolded, authorities quickly identified two suspects, Sierra Halseth, Daniel's own teenage daughter, and her boyfriend, Aaron Guerrero. The news of Sierra's involvement in her own father's murder sent shockwaves through the community. How could a young girl, seemingly innocent, be capable of such a heinous act? The search for answers intensified as the authorities launched a manhunt to bring Sierra and Aaron to justice. Just four days after the murder, the teenagers were apprehended in Salt Lake City. The swift arrest provided some relief to the grieving family and the community, but it also raised more questions. What could have driven these young individuals to commit such a horrific crime? The answers would soon come to light as the case unfolded. During the sentencing hearing, Sierra made disturbing claims against her father, accusing him of sexual and physical abuse, as well as forcing her to consume alcohol. These allegations painted a picture of a deeply troubled family dynamic, with Sierra's parents going through a contentious divorce and custody battle. Sierra's mother, believing her daughter's accusations, had been fighting to have Sierra removed from Daniel's home. However, the evidence presented in court did not fully support all of Sierra's claims. 
It was revealed that the teen couple's parents had told them to stop seeing each other before Daniel was brutally murdered. The validity of Sierra's allegations then became a subject of intense scrutiny, leaving many wondering about the truth behind the disturbing accusations. The courtroom became a battleground of conflicting narratives, with emotions running high. The controversies surrounding the case further fueled public interest and divided opinions. Some sympathized with Sierra, believing her claims of abuse and seeing her as a victim driven to extreme measures. Others, however, questioned the veracity of her allegations and condemned her for the brutal murder of her own father. The sentencing hearing for Sierra Halseth and Aaron Guerrero was a highly anticipated event as the community awaited justice for the brutal murder of Daniel Halseth. The courtroom was filled with tension and emotions ran high as the judge delivered the verdict. Sierra and Aaron pleaded guilty to multiple charges, including murder with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit murder, arson, robbery with a deadly weapon, conspiracy to commit robbery, and fraudulent use of a credit or debit card. The gravity of their crimes weighed heavily on the court, and the judge handed down a sentence that would forever alter the course of their lives. Both teenagers were sentenced to life in prison with the possibility of parole after 22 years. It was a sentence that reflected the severity of their actions and the devastating loss suffered by Daniel's family. It has a total aggregate sentence of life in the Nevada Department of Corrections with the possibility of parole after 22 years. Sierra and Aaron's reactions to their sentencing varied. Sierra, who had made shocking allegations against her father, showed little emotion as the sentence was read. Aaron, on the other hand, appeared visibly shaken, his face etched with a mix of fear and remorse. Ethan Crumbly, it was a day that would forever be etched in the memories of the Oxford community in Michigan. On November 30th, 2021, chaos erupted at Oxford High School as gunshots rang out, leaving students and faculty in a state of terror. The perpetrator behind this heinous act was none other than Ethan Crumbly, a troubled teenager who was just 15 years old at the time. Armed with a 9mm semi-automatic handgun, Ethan walked into the southern end of the school building, firing in the hallway as students moved around during passing time. When he saw that they started fleeing, he deliberately walked down the hallway and shot into classrooms and at students who were unable to escape. By the time he was done, Ethan had murdered four students and injured seven people, including a teacher. He was arrested almost immediately and charged as an adult on all 24, crimes including terrorism and murder. The news of the shooting spread like wildfire, capturing the attention of the nation. The devastating impact of this tragedy sent shockwaves through the community, leaving everyone searching for answers. To truly understand the events that unfolded on that fateful day, we must examine the factors that led Ethan Crumbly down such a dark and dangerous path. Reports suggest that Crumbly had exhibited troubling behavior long before the shooting took place. Friends and acquaintances of Crumbly described him as a troubled teen who often displayed signs of anger and aggression. Some even recall instances of him making disturbing comments about violence and expressing a fascination with firearms. It is important to note that Crumbly's troubled home life also played a significant role in shaping his path. Reports indicate that he came from a broken family, with parents who were facing their own challenges. Another critical factor that cannot be ignored is Crumbly's easy access to firearms. It has been alleged that his parents, Jennifer and James Crumbly, failed to secure their weapons properly, allowing their troubled son to obtain a firearm, and for this, they got arrested on charges of involuntary manslaughter. In the aftermath of the shooting, the wheels of justice began to turn. The court proceedings shed light on the disturbing behavior exhibited by Ethan Crumbly leading up to that fateful day. Judge Kwame Rowe presided over the case, carefully considering the evidence presented by the prosecution. As the trial progressed, it became evident that Crumbly's behavior extended beyond the shooting itself. Even while in custody, he managed to bypass security measures to access graphic and violent content online on a jail tablet. The judge expressed concerns about Crumbly's potential for rehabilitation, given his continued obsession with violence. However, amidst the chilling revelations, the court also had to consider Crumbly's age at the time of the crime. In Michigan, first-degree murder carries an automatic life sentence for adults, but Crumbly's status as a minor presented a unique challenge for the court. The judge had the option to consider a shorter term that would allow for the possibility of eventual release. After weeks of expert testimonies and witness accounts, the court made its ruling. Judge Rowe announced that Ethan Crumbly is eligible for life imprisonment without the possibility of parole, the harshest punishment in the state of Michigan. Well, Ethan Crumley, the teenager who killed four students at Oxford High School in 2021, could get life in prison without parole for killing four students. This decision sent shockwaves through the courtroom and the nation as the gravity of Crumbly's actions sank in. With his head bowed, Crumbly appeared to be grappling with the weight of such a lengthy sentence and what that meant.
Jennifer Me. Next, we delve into the story of Jennifer Me, also known as the Hiccup Girl, who gained international fame for her uncontrollable hiccups. But fame quickly turned to infamy when Me became involved in a crime that would change her life forever. It all began in 2007 when Jennifer Mee, a seemingly ordinary teenager from St. Petersburg, Florida, developed a case of hiccups that would soon make headlines worldwide. These hiccups were no ordinary hiccups. Jennifer claimed to be hiccuping an astonishing 50 times a minute, a condition that baffled doctors and fascinated the public. The sound echoes through the TIA terminal, announcing the arrival of 15-year-old Jennifer Mee. Jennifer's condition quickly caught the attention of the media, and she became a sought-after guest on various television shows. She appeared on talk shows, morning shows, and even reality TV programs, all in search of a cure for her relentless hiccups. The nation was captivated by her struggle, and her story became a viral sensation. Despite the efforts of countless individuals and medical professionals, Jennifer's hiccups persisted. But then, a glimmer of hope appeared in the form of Dr. Bob Lindy, a holistic doctor from Tampa, Florida. Dr. Lindy offered Jennifer a unique treatment that combined alternative therapies and traditional medicine. Jennifer decided to give Dr. Lindy's treatment a chance, and to the amazement of everyone, her hiccups finally stopped. The nation rejoiced with her, and Jennifer's story took a turn from a tale of struggle to one of triumph. She became known as the Hiccup Girl and was hailed as a symbol of resilience and hope. But just when it seemed like Jennifer's life was taking a positive turn, tragedy struck. In 2010, she found herself caught up in a crime that would shatter her newfound fame and change the course of her life forever. It was a seemingly ordinary day when Jennifer Mee met a man online. Little did she know that this encounter would lead her down a dangerous path. Jennifer invited the man to a vacant home where two of her friends lay in wait. Their intentions were not innocent. They had planned to rob the man, but things quickly spiraled out of control. The robbery took a deadly turn, resulting in the tragic death of the man. Jennifer, along with her friends Laren Rayford and Lamont Newton, were now facing a crime of unimaginable magnitude. The once famous hiccup girl had become entangled in a web of violence and deceit. As the details of the crime emerged, the nation was left in shock. Prosecutors argued that although Jennifer did not physically pull the trigger, she orchestrated the events that led to the man's death. They claimed that she lured him into the robbery, setting the stage for the tragic outcome. Following the evidence presented, the jury delivered a verdict that would forever change Jennifer's life. The jury found Jennifer Mee guilty of first-degree murder. As the verdict was read, Jennifer broke down. We the jury finds as follows to defend that in this case, defend that is guilty of murder in the first degree as charged. Her hopes of a lesser charge shattered. That wasn't the end of tears for Jennifer as she also broke down in the courtroom when she was handed a life sentence behind bars without the possibility of parole. Her co-defendants, Laren Rayford and Lamont Newton, received the same sentence. David Moses. David Moses, a name that will forever be associated with darkness and brutality. This troubled teenager, along with his accomplices Angelique and Catilla Nash, was convicted of first-degree murder in the horrifying killing of 81-year-old Dorothy Sessions. What started as a simple burglary quickly escalated into a nightmarish scene of unimaginable violence. Our story begins in the quiet town of Bakersfield, where 81-year-old Dorothy Sessions lived a peaceful life. Little did she know that her world was about to be shattered by the actions of two troubled teenagers, David Moses and Cotillion Nash. It was the year 2010 when Moses and Nash, fueled by a desire for quick cash, embarked on a path of destruction that would forever change their lives and the lives of those around them. On that fateful day, Dorothy Sessions was innocently cooking dinner in her Northeast Bakersfield home when the two teenagers broke in, intending to burglarize the house. But what started as a simple burglary quickly turned into a nightmare of unimaginable proportions. As Sessions confronted the intruders, she was met with a level of violence that defied comprehension. Moses and one of the Nash sisters unleashed a brutal and merciless attack on the elderly woman, beating her to the point of being unrecognizable. The sheer brutality of the crime sent shockwaves through the community, leaving everyone in disbelief. What makes this crime even more horrifying is the fact that David Moses was already on juvenile probation at the time. This was not his first brush with the law, nor would it be his last. Moses had a history of violence, a dark past that contributed to his lengthy criminal record. During the trial, prosecutor David Wilson revealed the disturbing truth about David Moses' past. He had a pattern of physical, verbal, and emotional abuse, leaving a trail of victims in his wake. Shockingly, Moses had sexually assaulted his own sister and a developmentally disabled cousin among seven other children while residing in a group home. The extent of his depravity was truly chilling. 
As the trial unfolded, the gravity of the situation hung heavy in the air. The courtroom was filled with tension and anticipation, as everyone awaited the verdict for the heinous crime committed by Moses. But what unfolded next left everyone in disbelief. While most individuals would be trembling with fear and remorse when facing the possibility of life in prison, David Moses appeared to be anything but concerned. In fact, his behavior was nothing short of disturbing. Throughout the court proceedings, Moses displayed a strange detachment from the gravity of his situation. As the judge read out the charges and the potential consequences, Moses seemed almost amused. He chuckled, laughed, and yawned repeatedly, and at one point even fell asleep in his seat. It all appeared as if he found the entire process to be nothing more than a game. The courtroom was left in shock, struggling to comprehend the lack of remorse displayed by this dangerous teen. The audacity of his actions was astounding as if he believed he was above the law and immune to the consequences of his actions. It was a chilling sight, one that left a lasting impression on all those present. The prosecution, the defense, the judge, and even the spectators were taken aback by Moses' behavior. How could someone facing a life sentence for such a brutal crime show such indifference? It was a question that haunted everyone involved in the case. The impression that David Moses gave during the court proceedings was that he saw it all as a game, a mere spectacle to be observed with detached amusement. His lack of remorse and empathy was deeply unsettling, leaving many to question the depths of his depravity. For his crime, he was sentenced to life in prison without parole. Despite the heavy sentence, David Moses was all smiles, not once showing contrition at the devastating pain he had caused a family. Conrad Schaefer from the fatal shooting of David Steven Guerrero, a 17-year-old on his way to work, to the horrifying home invasion that ended in the murder of Eric Rupnarin, Conrad Schaefer's actions were one that left a lasting impact on the victim's families and the entire Osceola County community. It all began on a fateful day in June 2013. David Guerrero, a 17-year-old boy with a bright future ahead, was innocently waiting at a bus stop in Kissimmee on June 26. Little did he know that his life was about to be tragically cut short. Schaefer, who was 15 at the time, fueled by a disturbing motive that remains unclear to this day, approached Guerrero and without warning, pulled out a gun. In a matter of seconds, a single gunshot echoed through the air, ending Guerrero's life and leaving the community in shock. But this was just the beginning. A few days later, Schaefer, along with three of his friends, embarked on a home invasion in Poinciana. Their target was Eric Rupnarin, a 22-year-old man who had no idea of the horrors that awaited him. Bursting into Rupnarin's home, Schaefer and his accomplices unleashed a wave of violence. Rupnarin was shot and had his throat slit, leaving him to suffer a gruesome fate. The brutality of these crimes sent shockwaves through the community. Homes and cars were riddled with bullets, and fear gripped the hearts of residents. The authorities were determined to bring those responsible to justice and put an end to the reign of terror that Schaefer had unleashed. In January of the following year, Schaefer stood before the court, charged with two counts of first-degree murder. The evidence against him was overwhelming, leaving little room for doubt. Recognizing the severity of his crimes, Schaefer made the decision to to plead guilty, hoping to avoid a lengthy trial and the possibility of a harsher sentence. During his sentencing in 2016, the courtroom was filled with tension as the judge prepared to deliver the verdict. Schaefer, now 18 years old, stood stoically, his face betraying no emotion. The families of the victims, their hearts heavy with grief, looked on, seeking solace in the hope that justice would be served. And justice did come, but in a way that would send shockwaves through the courtroom. The judge, fully aware of the gravity of Schaefer's crimes, handed down two consecutive life sentences, one for each first-degree murder charge. The decision was met, with a mix of relief and anguish from the families, knowing that Schaefer would spend the rest of his life behind bars. As the sentence was read out, Schaefer's expression remained unchanged. It was as if he had resigned himself to his fate, accepting the consequences of his heinous actions. This video of dangerous teens reacting to life sentences serves as a stark reminder of the potential darkness that can reside within individuals, even at a young age. It also underscores the importance of addressing underlying background issues and the consequences of unchecked behaviors. For more thought-provoking videos like this, click on the card showing on your screen for more, and I'll be waiting on the other side.